so you, I, I know a lot of artists I've already spoken to who are very excited to see you perform. Yes, um, thank you. And thank I know you. you're excited to see some of them perform. But oh my God, yeah. What's it like to sort of be in this community of folks who, I mean, I know you're in the city, so you do get to see a lot of folks who, who inspire you or yeah. they, and work with some great people. I do, yeah, um, I But do. to be in this sort of environment today with folks who have some like-minded I mean, I think the first thing it does is it's like when you hear people sound checking, you're like, okay, I got to step my pussy up to quote T.S. Madison. Does anyone know who T.S. Madison is? Anyway, that's her term. I'm quoting T.S. Madison. You have to step your pussy up, meaning that one has to work at a higher level. That's, that's you know, I'm translating like the, uh, the vernacular. It's not even vernacular. I'm especially, you know, it's not a culture I'm part of, but I enjoy uh, T.S. Madison's um her, um, her, I, I, her vernacular and so stepping your pussy you, so the first thing you think is like damn these people are like really good and so you want to really you know bring it um, that's the first thing uh, and then yeah I mean it, it, it's really exciting because I think that the main thing like sometimes I even wonder if I like music if I'm like in an Uber I take a lot of cars or Lyft in New York City and there's like some radio thing playing some corporate radio thing and I'm just I'm like can you can you please turn it off? Like, and, it's, and you have to be really delicate, you know, because they're in the car too when they're working and maybe they want this really terrible music playing while they're driving. I was like, excuse me, sir, excuse me. <laughs> I don't, I mean, if you really, do you, it, sometimes I feel like they put the music on for my benefit and they're like, well, I don't really need to hear this. You're killing me. If you could, you know, but if you really want it on, maybe you could turn it down a little bit. I mean, so sometimes I wonder if I actually, in fact, like music. And then I was just listening to everyone's soundtrack and I was like, oh, my God, I love music. I just love a very particular kind of music. And I mean, I think what's really exciting about this festival is that it's just, I mean, I think it's really well curated. Um, I think the music is really good. There was that jazz band that was playing that was like, amazing. I didn't meet the piano player, but he was fantastic. The saxophonist was fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I um, it's just great to, I somehow, my, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I was sort of in the dressing room looking around, you know, um, at Caleb, you know, from Sacred Bones. I mean, I was just like, okay, <laughs> like, I'm here, I am, I'm playing this thing. It's, um, it's well, pretty great. I mean, you fit into, in some ways, having uh, Lingua Ignata here today. Um, and I, I'm like a sycophantic fan, like I'm hardcore. There, I mean, it's very, it's amazing that you're both in the same room. Be and not and only because you're right fans, after but, me. She's playing right after me. But you yeah. share that sort of, you make music that is not only extremely intentional, but it's extremely personal, But and it speaks to a much lighter, wider global internet, you know, uh, deeper issue. Uh, yeah. And it's visceral, and it, it, it hits things that, people don't want to confront and they're not going to listen to it in a taxi uh, because they'd so, be forced yeah. to think. That is, a, and, that is a good point. I mean, that, that we don't make easy listening music, like elevator music. I mean, a lot of that, and I like trap, you know, whatever, there's something about the Migos that comes on with that, those triplet, that, that triplet <laughs> hi-hat thing going on. I mean, I mean, there's just more music need, I think it needs to serve a sacred purpose. I think it needs to serve like a purpose, a life sustaining. I mean, and joy is a fine thing. I mean, like I, there was this like, this is interview, so, was it in uh, the New Yorker or there was this article, I think it was some dude, okay, so, so some dude writes this thing about Prince, like he was like, I guess like hired to write Prince's like biography. No one had ever written a biography that was approved by Prince, you know, and this was like, you know, right before he died, and, you know, died before it could happen. And so there's all this sort of like stuff, like he sort of starts the article with like, you know, I wrote this, this sort of statement of purpose. I love Prince for this reason, and Prince's music means this to me. Guy's 29. All these like really old seasoned people, you know, who write rock biographies are like applying for this job, and the, the, the publishing company saying, you should go with this guy. He's done all these things, and Prince chooses the like, Guys who never in the book, never been published or anything, who wrote this like you know like I guess compelling essay, and um, and so then Prince like then like they meet and this is this whole like Paisley Park like sort of like drama of like you know like I go you know he's at some like weird Motel Six or whatever and he's just, like <laughs> you just, he just waits there till Prince is ready for you know it's just, you know like this is all this like pomp and circumstance, and they finally are in the same room. And Prince is like, did you bring a copy of the thing that you, you wrote, like, about my, you know, so, oh, I, I didn't bring a copy in. So, well, so tell me about this, this, I guess he had a copy, so tell me what you meant when you said this. Tell me what you meant when, you know, and so, and then he said, you know, I, I hate words like magic, you know, uh, when people describe my music, or I hate things like, he breaks all the rules, you know, he's like, funk and soul music, they're about rules. When I was a kid and I heard stuff like Led Zeppelin, you, do you know about the devil tone? Do you know about the devil tone, the tritone in you? In music, he's like that. When I heard the Led Zeppelin, I heard all that stuff, and I was like, "That's not what I'm trying to do. That, those, that's rule breaking. Like my music doesn't do that." And, and it was this moment when I was like, "Wow!" Like I have more in common with Led Zeppelin than Prince. Um, 
and I think actually it's true. I, I like you know because you know Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin they both started as blues cover bands, uh, and Whole Lot of Love. You know we know um, like Willie Dixon sued them because it's his song. And they were like, oh, yeah, 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 it's your song. We'll just give you royalties. They just didn't even, like, fight it. Um, and so I love, I guess, what British white people have done with the blues tradition and that tritonality. And, you know, obviously Prince is a Jehovah's Witness. Obviously, he's, you know, very invested in God. He's not going to go into that that tritonality, which I, you know, you'll hear lots of tritonality in my set tonight. Um, I don't remember where I started with that, where how I... Um, got off onto that tangent about Prince and the, I think I was trying to lead up to this whole thing about, about the devil. And yeah, I mean, so the same kind of dissonance that, that is, is mm. reflective of the world. I mean that um, I'm also obsessed with, um, with the Tristan chord. If, if you know about the Tristan chord, it's like a, it's a certain kind of dissonance that happens at the beginning of Tristan and Isolde. Oh, well. um, yeah. and the thing that's extraordinary about that, that dissonance is that it happens for about four hours, you know, and you don't get any kind of resolution. Because typically in music, you know, you you have like a dissonant chord that you you know sort of maybe immediately resolve because people are like, you know, maybe uncomfortable with that amount of dis. If you don't resolve it, um, but it takes Wagner like until the very sort of last minutes of a four-hour opera to come to any resolution because you know often in life there's no resolution. My music theory teacher is like sort of flaming. Um, homosexual who was a Christian and married to a woman and but I saw him cruising about it. anyway I adore this man nothing about his you know what, flame, but he was a flaming hom- you could be a flaming homosexual who's not practicing homosexual but I just saw him in the bathroom you know trying to suck dick so but anyway that's beside the point he um, was talking about the Moonlight moon Sonata you know there's like this, these dissonant you know sort of tones of the Moonlight Sonata and he would sort of be playing he was like mm, did you hear that did you hear that's pain he would say and then he was sort of like, I've seen him, he, actually, I was in his choir class, he had a, a gospel choir class and a music theory class, and I was in both of them, and he would do this, the same routine, and he would jump up. If you can imagine Little Richard playing the Moonlight Sonata, it's like that kind of personality. Um, like very God-fearing, very, but very self-possessed. He jumps up and he's like, that's pain, you know, and he gets up, he's like, you know, sometimes in life, you can't resolve mm-hmm. the conflict, but in music you can. It has become It has And so I love this idea, you know, in Wagner first, but then in, in a lot of like, you know, sort of dissonant, like black metal or dissonant noise music, that there is a lot of confusion and, and a lot of, a lot of like dissonance that is unresolved. Um, I know so many lives that have, you know, ended in death, uh, suicide or whatever, that uh, these things are just not resolved. Uh, things aren't often resolved. And so I like, I think that there needs to be music that speaks to that. And so, you know, probably it's not, most radio friendly thing, but it still play like the, that. That the, you know, Godfather of all tritones of like in Funeral Doom is you know Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath, on um, the first album of Black Sabbath, um, and that tritonality. And you know, you um, rock radio stations you still hear that, and that's the fantastic thing. You know, that tritonality that just sounds very evil. Uh, it's an ev- ev- evocation of the devil. And I always like to say that, like, in my evocation of the devil, when I, you know, people are concerned about my upside, black people especially, my upside down crosses and all this sort of talk about the devil, and I, and I talk about slavery and emancipation and you know uh, slaves were like sort of forced to you know read the bible only they were like not encouraged to read or learn to read but if they were it was only the bible and then we have this emancipatory moment when like suddenly the slaves are freed and there's a different kind of music that emerges at that moment this emancipatory moment uh that is a rejection of that kind of enforced christianity and it's the blues uh, and so I, I, I call myself a devil worshiping free black man in the blues tradition to evoke that particular emancipatory moment. Uh, for me, that moment is a very um, meaningful, important moment that needs to be sort of um, 
like talked about. I think that there's like a um, there's a, a rigidity sometimes that happens um, with um, black people around Christianity that just seems unnecessary. I mean, I'm not I'm not an anti Christian person. I mean, like my um, main collaborator is a, is, a, is a hardcore Christian. He actually went to Union Theological Seminary, studied with James Cone. One of my James Cone is actually one of my um, theoretical idols. Deep Christian in, in the um, Black liberation theology tradition. And are, are, are we talking about Hunter? Uh, I'm sorry. For, uh, are we talking about Hunter from? Oh no no no. Oh. Um, no no no. This is my friend Tucker okay. uh, Tucker Culbertson who went to Union Theological Seminary. Hunter went to Columbia and yeah. studied philosophy, but he's very interested in in religion. Obviously, we were talking about Hunter Hunt Hendricks, the uh, founder uh, of Liturgy, the band Liturgy, and uh, main songwriter for Liturgy. I guess you talked to Greg Fox, the original I did. drummer, he was the original drummer for Liturgy. Yeah yeah. yeah. I, I love Greg Fox and I love Hunter. Um, but yeah, Hunter and I made a record together um, called Funeral Doom Spiritual. We played lots of shows together, like in New York. Like I don't know, like we played I don't know maybe ten or so shows in New York together, and then we played a show in L.A. and a show in San Francisco, and then we did um, Funeral Doom Spiritual with Hunter as, in the audience because we had an ensemble do a string ensemble do his part, and then we had someone do his electronic stuff. But um, yeah, and Hunter is very interested in. in, in Questions of God, actually, the new liturgy. Have you heard the new liturgy single? Uh, uh, yes, I tweeted about it because I was... God <laughs> of love. No, it's it extraordinary. Took me, it's it, extraordinary. Took, it took me five days to, to hear it after it came out, and I regretted not hearing it for those five days. Why that did was it so take good. so long? I don't... I just forgot. It was, it was a busy People have a, you, you have probably... You have a wife and children, don't you? I, I do. Yeah, I, that, do. I, that would imagine would be very distracting from... I don't know a life, uh, like li- a life in art. You know, like a this life is in true. Art. This is true, but not, certainly that is a life. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, but, that is the life. But, but my, you, you listening know. to your music is most of my life, so it was yes. surprising that I did. Yeah, that you did. But it's so good. It's so good. It's amazing. Um, you know, um, Hunter. We talk a lot about God um, and sort of questions of God and, and religiosity and uh, what that means. So I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, and I mean the, the sort of Christian or the Christ myth is very fascinating. You know, uh, a lot of. My work is sort of like concerned with this kind of. I mean, a lot of James Cone's ideas. You know, James Cone uh, wrote this book called *The Cross and the Lynching Suite*. You'll see a lot of that sort of this, these sort of cr- images of crosses, upside down crosses, um, in it with the lynching sort of inside of them. You'll see a lot of that in the show tonight. Um, maybe yeah, I, it, and they'll probably edit they, if they film the show. They can edit some of that in. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm giving you direction to see if you could just pop some of that footage. Um, Whoever's editing this, who, who, who's, uh, who's editing? Anyway, um, but if you get footage from tonight, you'll see the anyway. Um, and so a lot of that idea of the cross and the lynching uh, tree is this um, notion that lynchings were in fact 20th century uh, crucifixions. And so I'm very interested in, in you know sort of via um, sort of questions of like you know black suffering, um, black um, dismemberment, all the kinds of the the very kind of violent cannibalistic um, relationship that like you know white. People had to black bodies in within lynching where they cut off penises, toes, fingers uh, for trophies, trophy collecting. You know, this is like recent American history that people don't talk about. I'm very interested in this. I mean, in, in the kind of the new white supremacy is is very much about the new white supremacy is very much like the old white supremacy, yeah. but it's sort of a new with a new sheen on it. Uh, it's very much that same kind of cannibalism, uh, and, and, and usually, it's, I think it's happening in pornography. I have this this show called American Cuck. Um, where I'm sort of trying to deal with, um, well, like this got American Cock in the subtitle is from plantations to Pornhub to Breitbart.com, and um, that piece is trying to sort of deal with that that lineage, that etymology of of the cock. And the cock is in conservative circles. I mean, does everyone know about the cock in conservative circles? Right, it's become a very mythological thing. Like they were referring to Jeb Bush when he was running for president mm-hmm. as a cock conservative, uh, or Marco Rubio was also being referred to as a cock. These people are not sufficiently masculine enough to leave the country. You have to have a certain amount of testosterone, a certain amount of uh, ability to have your wife not sleep with a black man. I mean, cuckolding doesn't specifically mean that your wife or girlfriend is sleeping with a black man but if you watch porn on Pornhub it just that seems to be what the narrative is all about I mean and, and what's interesting is that it's a very old narrative a, a sort of a plantational narrative if you, if you see films like um, like Mandingo or read sort of certain kinds of accounts uh, sort of slave narrative accounts it's like very much a thing that has survived you know for about 400 years uh, in this country and I'm just fascinated like how, how does that like it's an oral tradition it's like a I, you know what I mean you have to like just think about it how does like this idea that like black men are sort of like hyper masculine hypersexual have bigger dicks than everybody else how does that sort of notion that we can trace back very clearly to plantations how does it survive for 400 years in the white imagination and then, then you know and then it infiltrate into mine because it was a very I got this whole thing for, I would say fairly late when I was like 19 and 
I was in a sex club in San Francisco and some anyway. I won't go into de- too much detail about that, but I this was my first lesson in what was really going on in the minds of white people when they were trying to have sex with black people. Anyway, um, but how, it's fact, this is, this is interesting. This is everyone. This is a room full of people. You can't see all the people here. But there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Six people. It, it, this is a fascinating question. How would these things survive, like from slavery, like four hundred? How does these these sort of antique notions about you know sort of white supremacist notions survive? And so it, it must be passed on well, families. We use terms that are that are straight from from the slavery in our in our I mean daily conversations. In our daily that conversations, don't, don't um, certainly, and in, in pornography, I think there's a lot of maintenance of white supremacy and white supremacy. I think it's the same way that sexism, you know, and sort of wi- ideas about women are proposed. You know, I think there's something. You understand the culture by the, what's going on with the pornography, which is really, I mean, yeah, I don't know how much, pornog- I mean, just for research, I only watch pornography for research purposes. Of course. Uh, only. But, um, <laughs> but I, I don't know if you guys, you know, watch pornography for research purposes, but you really do understand a lot about what's going on with the culture, its relationship to women, people of color. Um, like and, and the crisis that's going on with with men, white men and, and black men, mostly white men because white men are the people who are mostly producing pornography. I mean, the makers of pornography are mostly white men. So you really get a lot of sort of insight into the psychology and the sort of depravity on one side, and then the, the sort of the identity crisis going on with white men. I mean, so much of what is really the the all right movement is about is, is the, the, this notion of the disenfranchisement of you know straight white men, and then them sort of like you know rising up and sort of like saying we're not going to take it we're not going to be cucked out to these like pc feminist or these pc people of color or trans people who want rights it's like de- everything is just yeah. fine the way it is why do these people want to be treated like you know with decency and like you know as full citizens why is it you know it, they aren't cool just like you know being our like you know sort of fetish or our, it, you know, existing within our fantasy, it could be existing within the way that we imagine them. I mean, if you think about like cinema that's made predominantly by black men, I'm sorry, black men. That's my fantasy. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. Actually, I make films too. But you know, cinema made predominantly by white men. Um, like, just you get a, this deep insight, and then if you go into the pornography, it's like, damn. Because it's also like, you know, these white men. Certainly, it's about their psychology, but they also wouldn't make something that wouldn't sell. I mean, it's a huge industry, pornography. So if, anyway, if you want to just really understand. You know what's going on with people in their minds. Anyway, if you but maybe you don't. It's it's ugly. I mean, I've been kind of living inside of this stuff for a while. It's really, it's you know, yeah. I kind of need a break. Understood. Actually, I've been doing a lot of field work on this subject too. A lot of like on the ground, you know, research. <laughs> it's ugly. <laughs> it's real ugly. So, who are you? Uh, who are you going to catch today while you're? Uh... Um, Chris is, is my is my primary yeah. goal. Is my primary goal. But also, wait, I heard is it Crimson Crimson Rose? Is that what they're called? They were sound checking. Is that who who they are? Amazing! Like, first of all, I just heard this the most beautiful scream. Like this sort of like this like it was a really strong. It's a, the woman who sings. I think it's Crimson Rose. I think it's a rose. Some, I think that's what they're called. Uh, I'm obsessed with um I, I can I look at my phone I have a schedule but um they're playing I think really soon actually I really have to see them that in their sound check I heard this the most amazing extraordinary scream Cloud Rider pretty um, she is a pretty oh yeah that that's also absolutely worth catching uh, I mean yeah I mean I'm actually I'm, I'm gonna watch everything up till I play like probably from the green room and then, but I'll focus like right before I go and I have to focus on you know what I have to do. Um, and so there's that. But uh, I'm going to try to catch a lot of things. And then, of course, I'm going to catch Kristen after me. And then I'm probably going to... I've been awake for a really long time. So then I'm probably going to, you know, try to sleep. Are you, you can't... Unfortunately, I don't drive. And so the train doesn't leave here. They, it's like they tr- want to trap you for yep. the night or something. And so um, we are. We have some place we're staying, a house that we're staying in. And then we're leaving tomorrow morning. But um, So, yeah, I'm going to probably want to go sleep and um, decompress from this very long day. Um, but yeah, everything I can possibly see, you know, everything I've heard, I, it, cause I got here really early. So I heard people sound checking before, before me and then everything after me and it, everything was amazing. Um, and I, I don't like anything. Um, I don't like Music. anything. Um, so, um, everything here that I heard was extraordinary. And so I'm, you know, very excited. Oh yeah. There was this woman. So they're also doing this, um, these concerts from 
the, the green room. So there's like uh, the ledge, you know, and I guess Greg played there last yes. night from the ledge. Yep. And I, I mean, so right before my soundtrack, I heard these gorgeous voices and I was like, these these like sort of soprano, operatic sounding women. And I was like, they're stealing my gig. Um, <laughs> well, the, the body has 20, the 20 piece choir. Yes. Or something. Which is yes. ridiculous. Uh, very excited about that. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm I'm really, I'm down for all of it. It's great to be a part of you know, people who are, you know, sort of imagining um, the world differently and, and sort of, I mean, I, I always worry that there isn't, um, like my primary, I mean, even though I, you know, perform in cathedrals and I love that, or concert halls or, you know, like the Met, I just did this big show at the Met earlier this year, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I mean, and um, I love those shows. I Please continue to book me for those shows. I will always do those shows, but I love, love, love this DIY energy and even though this is a bigger festival it has like I feel like I'm playing with the glove in, in Brooklyn or and it has that kind of energy of like um, this sort of like underground feeling and that is really where I'm located uh, that is like you know really important to my identity like underground like goth scenes noise scenes metal scenes punk scenes um, really like it's where I grew up it's where how I like think of the world and I worry always that um this new uh, corporatization of everything um, doesn't have it, 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 there's no way to continue to support this stuff so this is really yeah. this is even happening just seems extraordinary to me uh, so I'm just thrilled that it's happening that I'm here like you know I'm pretty I mean I'm a really negative person because you know look around the world's fucked up but I've been in this like place of deep gratitude the last two weeks I'm like I'm flying I was just in Norway playing music then I had a show when I got back and I'm here playing music now I'm I mean, I'm traveling the world playing music is really, I mean, it's pretty great, right? Um, so, Absolutely. I mean, like, as much as, the, I mean, it's hard to not, I mean, I'm negative because the world is, people are terrible. The world is terrible. P- political things are terrible. I mean, like, the, all the sort of the separations of, like, children from their families at the border. I mean, all kinds of horrible, horrible things are going on constantly. Trans women being murdered. I mean, just like, you, just the list goes on and on and on. All kinds of, like, horrible injustices that, um, I mean, I'm a sensitive person. They affect me, you know? Like, I get, you know, these things affect It's not, like, just, like, me being, like... I get really emotional when I see horrible things happening, you know? I even, like, with the homeless people, I get really concerned. I can't, you can't, in New York, you can't really engage every homeless person who's asking, you know, like, I try to be nice to them and try to, but I'm very sensitive. Um, And so, but my life is actually, you know, it's not a bad life, you know, that I get to sing. I mean, singing, and singing is, um, I mean, the thing about being, I'm a depressed person, too. I mean, the thing about being really depressed is that um, it's hard to sing and be depressed. Um... Like, singing is ultimately about joy, even if you're singing about the worst things in the world, which I'm usually singing about the worst things in the world, because that's, I mean, that's my job. I mean, you know, what am I supposed to do? Sing, like, you know, what is that, what is that guy, uh, be happy? Don't worry, be happy. Yeah, that guy, or like Pharrell's happy. It's the same oh, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pharrell's happy, you're like the, what is his name? Like the, uh, yeah, Bobby McFerrin. Yeah, I can't do that. That's not, you know, that's not me. I, I mean, it's just, no one's going to believe me singing. <laughs> it's just absurd. Um, but the thing about, like, and I, I met Fred Moden. Do you know Fred Moden? He's an amazing writer, beautiful poet. I met him in Glasgow a few years ago. And um, he, like, sort of checked out my work, which is just, like, the most amazing honor in the world. And uh, he said, you're singing about all these horrible things, but you're singing your way out of it. Uh, and I'll never forget that because it's true. I mean, even if I'm singing about a horrible, horrible thing, by the end of it, at least I feel, you know, well, sometimes I don't feel better. Sometimes I'm devastated and I'm in tears. But generally, it's about a cathar- moving through something. All, all, everything I do is about a kind of catharsis um, for me and hopefully for the audience. But de- first for me, I mean, I don't, I can't. What you guys have got going on, you know, as an audience, you know, I can't really involve myself too much in that because you know, like I, I, you know, I can't. I have to be really focused on what I'm doing. Um, and I think if I'm doing my job, you know, then you know, you'll probably get it, feel it, or whatever, you know. Um, but really, it's about, I mean, and I think when you don't have joy in your life and when you're a depressed person, it, it's like, actually, this year has not been the easiest for me. Uh, but the last two weeks, I've been like, wow, singing, I really like singing. It's a really joyous thing to do. It's a great thing that's about kind of being happy, actually. Um, who knew? Um, <laughs> I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. 16 times.